episode 198 of School Librarians United. I'm your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian in my 16th year, I knew I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that all the ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast by myself, my interview guests, and listeners who reach out to the podcast are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. When incorporating research, I always make sure to cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast has something for you. I'd like to extend a very special welcome this week to listeners Dr. Murga in Australia, Julie in New Zealand, Shelley in Florida, Tim in Kentucky, Steve in New Jersey, Tom and Trinity in Ohio, Laura, Stephanie, and Lauren from the state of Washington. I welcome you and all listeners to reach out with your feedback and episode suggestions. You can reach me either on Facebook, on Twitter, my handle is at LMS underscore United, or the email address schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you include your mailing address, I'll be sure to send you a podcast sticker. And now a word from our official sponsor, Capstone. Capstone is an innovative publisher and education technology provider of children's content for school libraries, classrooms, and at-home learning. Home of the award-winning Pebble Go Research Database, Capstone has a passion for creating inspired learning and intellectual curiosity in children, and I am so excited to be working with them. Friends, I'm so glad Angie Kaltoff has joined us again from Capstone. Angie, welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Amy. Thanks for having me again. I'm so glad you're here. I got to tell you, I have been a huge fan of Pebble Go when I taught elementary. And I'm going to be the first to admit to you that my first opportunity to use Pebble Go Next was during the pandemic. And if I'm not mistaken, this was opened by Capstone during peak pandemic to support schools when we immediately went into shutdown in 2020. I love Pebble Go Next. And, and I was so like, oh, this is amazing. But for listeners, would you help us understand? Because for some of us, we may have experience with only one or the other platform. But can you give us a better understanding of Pebble Go and Pebble Go Next? And to be quite honest, why we should have both of them in our schools? <laughs> Yes, I'm so glad you asked. So one of our core values at Capstone is our hearts and minds are committed to our purpose and we make learning fun. So we really think about our users and their specific needs. So as you mentioned before, Pebble Go and Pebble Go Next are two different products, but they serve our K-5 audience. So think of Pebble Go for your early to non-readers or kindergarten through second grade. And the content for Pebble Go is aligned to the standards and the content you might see in your curriculum for that age range. Pebble Go Next, think third through fifth graders. And when you go between the two platforms, you're going to notice that in Pebble Go Next, our articles are much longer. They're made for that older audience. But the great thing about our product is that all of the text can be read to your students. So if you're a fourth grader, but you're uh, first grade reading level, you can have the text read to you. We also have every word in Pebble Go Next connected to a dictionary. So you can click on that word and understand the definition and have it read to you. Another thing you'll notice in Pebble Go Next is as you're scrolling through the article, you'll be able to scroll top to bottom or click on tabs across the top. And we're really doing that to help students start to understand that when they're doing research outside of Pebble Go Next as they get older, there are different ways to navigate your screen. So bringing in some of that digital literacy that you're going to be teaching your older students. Well, and I got to say a couple things that I loved about Pebble Go was that it really did invite the the users, the students to explore beyond what they had in in their heads. All too often our our littles were doing research and they really just wanted to learn about a cat and a dog because that in their sort of repertoire that's what they were thinking about. But you open up Pebble Go and all of a sudden all of these different engaging images of other animals, especially in for my students it was animals and it was the dinosaurs that they absolutely loved and and for them it was so visual appealing and it was designed with our littles in mind to 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 really sort of bring that engagement but could you also speak a little bit to um, the I know that this is a great way to support our English language learners 
because you have that read aloud component, but aren't there also articles in Spanish? Yes. So an add-on to your PubbleGo account that you could get is our Spanish modules. So all of our mod, every article in PebbleGo could be translated into Spanish by clicking one button. And I, I really think that, especially for those of us who are wanting very much to support uh, our, our English language learners, and, and also, by the way, a lot of my teachers teach in uh, a dual language uh, environment where the the students are learning also in Spanish in this case. And, and so they could do that because you could move between the, the articles so easily. Yes, when you're in Pebble Go, it's just a one button click. So it's easy to toggle back and forth. And all of our art articles have a natural voice audio, which means it's a person actually reading it to the students. It's a um, hired actor. So it's not that com computer voice. Well, and, and no shade on our databases, uh, but like, you know, Britannica and Worldbook are all sort of automated computer voices. And my students would get a giggle out of that because they invariably would push that play button and you got a very, you know, sort of automaton sort of, you know, mechanical c computer voice reading to you. And it was very, it just wasn't real. <laughs> Yeah, this is really helpful, like you said, for our students who are learning a second language or another language to hear that that fluent person reading to them, the intonation, the stops. Um, it's a valuable piece to learning how to read and learning another language. Oh. Angie, I'm so grateful you joined us again. Would you come back next week when we can pick your brain a, bit, a little bit more about how much we love Capstone and, uh, and share a little bit more with us? I will be here. Thank you. Thank you. I am so grateful to Capstone for their continued commitment to support the podcast in Season 5. They are offering listeners of School Librarians United a very special discount. Visit shop.capstonepub.com and use the code UNITED to get $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and Capstone interactive eBooks. That's code UNITED for $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and eBooks on shop.capstonepub.com. And now for today's episode, Genrefication, and my conversation with Kelsey Bogan. Kelsey Bogan, welcome back to the podcast. Oh, it's great to be back. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Friends, we are so lucky to have Kelsey join us for this conversation. The last time we recorded together, it was the end of season three, episode 134, Ditching Dewey. Friends, if you haven't heard this episode, do make time. Kelsey, you are hilarious and dare I say irreverent when it comes to some library topics. <laughs> Well, I try. I think you were the first one to, to call me that, and I love that word. So now I use it in my Twitter bio, too, irreverent. I had to Google it when you used it, and I was like, yeah, that pretty much hits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, friends, um, it, it, I I do enjoy all of my conversations. The one with, with Kelsey, episode 134, I was laughing out loud. Um, it was just such a – it was almost like I brought a stand-up comedian onto the show, and, uh, and to really sort of just – rip a new one into how flawed this system is and it you know and and better yet why we're still using it on so many levels and it, the fact is is that when we know we can do better we should i mean it's I, I, the reasons why we we so many of us still use Dewey is oftentimes just because of tradition, and that's a dumb reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I always, whatever we're doing, we should always ask ourselves why, and because it's always been that way is just never a good enough reason. Well, and that's one of the reasons why having you on the show today to talk about genrefication is so important. You know, friends, I don't make any apologies. I am neither an Instagram nor am I on TikTok. But Kelsey, you are dominating the TikTok scene. What motivates you and why have you decided to dedicate your creative energy in this way? Well, it was originally kind of a lark. Students just kind of challenged me to try it. And then I was like, okay, sure. You know, this was like my second or third year as a librarian. So I still had a lot of that that energy to try a lot of new stuff all at once. Um, but then I just found that as a storytelling method, it just was 
pretty successful. You know, there were so many misconceptions about libraries and library services that, you know, we are always wanting to address. And somehow as a profession, we just haven't found that way of really getting the public to understand, you know, what we do, why we do it. And just because of the way the algorithm works on TikTok, the, the potential reach of your message was so different that I just ended up starting to enjoy that, that um, storytelling tool that it was, that it is. Am I correct? You've hit the million mark in TikTok? I have had a couple videos uh, have a million or more views. Yes, it's not certainly not something that happens <laughs> regularly, but I've had a couple. <laughs> That's fantastic. All right. So you've reminded me and something I had forgotten. You're a library instructor through university. Yes, I started teaching a school librarian course with San Jose State um, last year. So I did two semesters and I'll do two more this year. Wow. Can I just ask, what do you teach? What class? Oh, it's, it's really great. It's called School Library Materials, which is sort of doesn't really encompass what it is, but we, we do, um, we do different modules. So we talk about a lot of the stuff I love to talk about, all of the, the issues and equity issues in, you know, that we need to address. And so we do a, a collections module, which is all about, um, you know, ditching Dewey and diversity audits and how to build equitable collections. And then we do a module on social media, you know, using social media to promote your library materials and program. And and then we talk about labeling, you know, the dastardly <laughs> labeling issues of libraries being leveled and labeled with, uh, you know, those limiting restrictions. So it's it's pretty great. I, I love teaching it. It's like the course I would have loved to have when I was in my program. Well, and forgive me, but you would have been a wonderful instructor if if I had been a student in your class, just because you're in the trenches, as it were. Uh, rather than being in academics, you are by day, you're a school librarian. And I presume this is something you do in the evenings when you're uh, currently in the middle of your semesters. Yes, yeah, so I'm. A, I it's kind of a nice mix because Dr. Harlan is the uh, the professor who is in charge of the course, and she brought me on to adjunct some of the sections. And it's kind of nice to have that mixture of the academic who can go deep into the delving of all the research and the publications, and then you know me, uh, the person who's putting it into practice. I feel like it's a really nice mixture. The two of us tackling the building of that course. Um, but I do think, yeah, my students do enjoy, and I would have too, you know, having a librarian who's like actually also doing it, although certainly it's hard to do both jobs, <laughs> you know, but it does, I, do, I think it does help it library and like, it can seem so it's hard to get the practical aspect when you're at school for it, I think, you know, so I think that is a nice, a nice thing to bring to the table. Absolutely. So for listeners who have not had the benefit of listening to your first episode or perhaps don't follow you as closely as I do on Twitter, would you reacquaint us with your day to day? Describe where in the country you are. Tell us a little bit about your library, the programs, the grades you support. What kinds of things that that are special to you in your space? Sure. So I'm a high school librarian. I think I'm in my seventh year. Time's gotten a bit washy lately. Um, but seventh year, I think, uh, high school librarian in outside of Philadelphia, in the suburbs outside Philly. Um, our high school, ninth through twelfth grade. Um, and when I I was hired with the intention that they wanted me to make changes to the the program, you know, that the the administration had the idea that it could be something more than it was, and but they weren't sure what. So I was brought on with a lot of support and freedom to be able to play with all this ditching Dewey and genrefication and all this stuff. So I've had a lot of freedom to really play and try different things. And so we've had a lot of success with building an equitable collection, increasing circulation, makerspace stuff, just creating the library as a community space, I'd say would be my main sort of prerogative. Well, and I, I will say, friends, I don't think we can ever sort of overstate the importance and value of having an administration that recognizes the value of what the potential good that our space can have for the entire s school community writ large. Because I think if the administration isn't on board with that vision, you, you're in for something of an uphill battle. But it sounds like you've had them on your side from the get-go. Yes. And sometimes, you, you know, it takes advocacy to get your admin. You know, sometimes admins are just never going to be able to see what a library could be. But mostly it's lack of 
experience with different kinds of libraries. So sometimes you can change their perceptions with good advocacy and good relationship building. And it can take time, but you can get there depending on, you know, the personalities at play. But no, I was I was fortunate. I, I was hired by an admin that was very open to trying new things. They weren't sure what they wanted. They just knew it could be something. Outstanding. You know, your blog posts are an absolute must read for me. Friends, I've included a link in the show notes. It is incredibly clear that you're intentional about your posts and you post regularly. And, and, I got to say, that is not the case with everybody who starts a post. I, I imagine there are a lot of people who create blogs with great aspirations of regularly posting, but you seem truly committed to this platform. And I, I think it's because you, you have gotten a great deal of, of support and, and positive feedback because of the time you put into your blog posts is not insignificant. You, you're incredibly detailed. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of a challenge for me in general, as I tend to be, I struggle with brevity. So my blog posts can turn into these manifestos really quickly. <laughs> these are kind of um, getting all of my words out. But um, they, it is time consuming, as you know, as a content creator to be consistent and regular. It's really tough. And I, I don't always hit it. You know, sometimes you'll see gaps of months. And then all of a sudden, you'll see like eight posts in a row, week, 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 week. And then there will be like two months of nothing. It's like, oh, well, there must have been something going on there, you know, but but I try. <laughs> is how incredibly generous you are. And this is going to come up more than once in this conversation. But friends, there's an index, which I've linked to because Kelsey recognizes sort of clusters your different blog posts so that people who are looking for something specific, I I appreciate that many of your posts are incredibly detailed such that somebody like myself, who's been a librarian now, this is like 16 years, I am still reaching out to this as a resource because you're incredibly thorough. And not only that, you include these amazing photographs of everything you do. So vibrant and engaging. And then you give stuff away for free. And again, I will mention this again. You have given away a great deal of resources. When you consider so many other people would have put those on a teacher paid teacher platform, the fact that you have made that commitment to share of, with others the resources that you have generated. Yeah, it's funny because the blog wasn't, I didn't really ever intend, I didn't think other people were going to read it. Like when I started blogging, it was just because I wanted to remember years later the things I had done and why I had done them, you know. <laughs> and and then I started to, I like to help pe- librarians do things and tackle things. And I was starting to type out these long answers in the Facebook boards for the same questions over and over again. Then that started to, yeah, to, yeah, as you know, same with you. Uh, and then that started to drive what posts I created. Cause then instead of typing out my long answer about how I genrefied, you know, it, 20 times a year in these Facebook posts, I could just link my blog post. So that's sort of how it sort of became. And then I'm like a big creator. I like I like to create things. I like to create, you know, little displays and things. And and I was they just are kind of being used in my library and sitting there, you know, and I was like, well, I'll just throw these up on the blog, too, because why not? You know, I mean, what what am I I, how much money are you going to make putting that up on teacher pay teacher anyway? Like, it's it's honestly more effort to have to, like, catalog it in there and, like, get all the (laughs) all the all the descriptions in there. Like, honestly, like, I mean, I'm no saint. Like, I, I do believe in valuing my time and labor. And I certainly do, you know accept honorariums for presentations and things like that but but it's like I like the balance it I give away a lot for free at, because I can because I'm fortunate to be able to make money in other in other directions and avenues so it's like it's like balance you know and I'm sure you do know <laughs> yeah well and let's segue you have a zazzle shop and I, I I think it's completely appropriate to mention right now because all of my devices have a a fantastic logo uh, you know sort of a, a design which you you created and and all of my my devices have them on there. So friends, I did include a link and I don't know, Kelsey, if you want to talk a little bit to your Zazzle uh, site that you have and it's linked in the show notes. 
now. I just whenever I, I don't know, I'm always creating random things. Sometimes they're funny, sometimes they're serious, but usually um, if people, like, I'll post something on Twitter, and if people like it, then I'll just turn it into a t-shirt or a button on Zazzle, so if people want to buy it, they can. Um, who just, just Amanda, Amanda Jones just bought a t-shirt. It's awesome. I can't wait. I hope a lot of us wear these at the next conference as we go to, but just says um, proud member of library Twitter, and then you can put your handle, and, and then it has the library bingo card, which is just like, that's like what I spent a Friday night creating, just as a joke. Like, I don't know why I do this stuff, but yeah, you'll find a random eclectic mixture of thoughts and ideas on my Zazzle, on my blog, all over the place, really. Well, and again, friends, take a look. The the resources in the show notes are always fantastic. But in this case, we got a little bit of everything. And and uh, again, both valuable for, for rookies and for veterans like myself. Again, so appreciate the time that you put into being as detailed as you are. So let me ask you, nearly every school librarian I've encountered describes themselves as overthinkers. And school librarians can get so bogged down in the planning of something that they actually, like starting the process, in this case, of genrefying, is really sort of stalled out. We're sort of paralyzed because we have, we're so consumed with that, that curating of resources. We sort of insist on knowing everything before we dip our toe, you know? So I'm hoping you can offer some advice to those uh, school librarians who are on board with genrefying but they haven't taken the plunge yet. Yeah, it's funny, you know, that you mentioned that because you probably, you might notice in my blog post that I don't tend to link a lot of citations and sources and other links. And that's because of that. It's like, I think we get down like those link rabbit holes and then we're always researching and never doing. So a lot of my blog posts is like, genrefication, here's 10 steps how to do it. But I'm not going to include like 20 of all the things I checked before I did it because now that's going to derail you guys too, you know? (laughs) So it is true. Um, But yeah, so for getting started, it it does, you can get the sort of paralyze, you know, paralyze, you know what I mean? I can't think of the word. Paralyzes. That's not how you pronounce it, but um, being paralyzed (laughs) too before acting. Um, So I always recommend that people just, like, you can start usually things in small scale, like, you know, if you're, you know, if you're looking at your whole collection and just thinking like, oh my God, how am I going to genreify this whole thing? It's like, well, you don't have to get it all done right away. I, it took me years. I mean, I really went through a long process before it was finished. <laughs> uh, it doesn't have to take years, but, you know, just one step. The first step I did was I just started putting the genre labels on the books. I left them in their regular order, regular alphabetical order. And then over the course of like a year and a half, I was just ca- going through when I had time and putting the genre labels on. That's one step you can do. You could do one genre, start with just one genre, pull some popular fantasy into a little fantasy section, you know, so like chunking things up, I think helps. Well, and I think that all too often when it comes to library projects, across the board, usually the first piece of recommendation is to weed so that you're not doing things with books that you're not otherwise going to to actually keep long term. But wouldn't it also be fair to say that you could do the two things at the same time? Yeah, I mean, it just depends, I guess, on how distractible you are. I am distractible, very distractible. So I do that thing where like you've gone to look for a pair of socks and now you've all your socks are on the floor because the socks weren't organized, but then you notice this drawer wasn't organized and now that that's like how my brain is. So for me it's tough sometimes to do. Um but sometimes I do do things together. Like just now I was shifting and weeding books at the same time, you know, because it just makes sense. Um and but yeah, so it, it I mean, I think Chunking things is the best thing. So, like, if I'm going to do a section, I just start with one section. Like, let's do the A's. And maybe I'm going to weed the A's and then do the genrefying stickers on the A's and then go down the line. So um, the weeding question is kind of six and one half dozen in another. You can weed first so you have fewer books to genrefy. Or you can genrefy, which will help inform your weeding. So it really can go either direction, I think, for that. I am, um, friends, I'll include in the show notes, I have a sign that became my my sort of, um, it gave me permission to take time, and it was an under construction sign. It just said, under construction, and I had a great genrefic genrefication sign and then I put under construction across it because I wanted my my students to know, I wanted my teachers to know that I am in the midst of something and I am by no means finished I think it's fair to say that when you're genrefying, the the idea of being finished really isn't the right way to 
to define how this ends, because as listeners will find when we're, we're having this conversation, it really is a process and a reevaluation, uh, all a sort of very cyclical and, and you are always reevaluating what we're doing. Yeah, and I think that's true with really all levels of library maintenance or management or collection development, whatever we're calling it. Um, it really isn't ever finished, which it, I know can stress some people out and make them feel like it's the laundry that's never done. Um, but in a way, it's also kind of freeing because it's like, well, it's never going to be finished. So what are you stressing about? You're not going to get to the end anyway. So it's just about moving the needle, you know, and it's the same with weeding. It's like you're never done weeding. You're never done, you know, shifting things and changing things and your community's needs are always changing, so the collection's going to need to always change too. So it's really becomes more about prioritizing and continuing to forge ahead than stressing about getting it finished, you know? You know, the benefits of genrefying a collection for any age group are well established. And this episode isn't about winning converts. But spelling out ways that school librarians can navigate this undertaking with their own collections, you did raise two justifications, which I hadn't considered before, but this completely makes sense. A genrefied collection not only simplifies collection development and makes that process easier, but you also have a much easier time making curricular connections to support learning in the classroom. Yeah, so I, this is one of the big questions people always ask is like, how do you pick your genres, right? And I think that's one of the things that freezes people because there's a lot of choices and you can't really mimic what somebody else did because it might not make sense for your community. Um, so that's one of the key. So the two different things I looked at was what what kind of things were kids asking for using the language the kids use. If they come in and say and call it mysteries, then that's what you need to be thinking about calling a section. You know, if they're saying sports books, then you need to be thinking like that. You know, how many students come in and ask for realistic fiction? Not super common in, in my school anyway that's not terminology they use you know so that was the first piece was look listening for the words they use the the trending types of books they're always asking for and how they ask for it and then the second piece was the curricular connection that was another thing that fed the way the sections I chose. You know, our 10th grade does a big mystery or no, a horror unit. Um, you know, they do Poe and all that stuff so that eventually it made sense to have a horror section. They do, you know, a historical fiction section, you know, they do a unit on it. So like those connections really help too, because curriculum drives interest as well as need. You know, students learn something in a unit and then it can spark legitimate outside interest for them. And, but it also is where they learn the terminology and what, what that means. So, you know, you'll see that it, even outside of the unit, it still drives interest and need. Wonderful. You know, I did want to ask about timing because I'm not in favor of this process happening over the summer when presumably most of us are not being compensated. Can you speak to the concerns listeners might have about this process disrupting their space during the school year? Yeah, it's a great thing to point to bring up because I also am not, I do not encourage people to do free labor for their employers. <laughs> it is a real easy thing for us to fall into wanting to do this for the kids, do this for whatever. But, you know, if we don't value our time and expertise, uh, employers never will. And that's just the sad truth of the world we live in. So, you know, we really do want to do this during contracted paid time. And it is okay if that means that it's not, it doesn't happen as prettily as we like or as quickly as we like. That's okay. It's important for our own wellness and to avoid burnout that we care for ourselves in this way, I believe. It's also, I believe, important for us to model to students to not allow employers to exploit you. I think our students deserve to see that from us. They deserve to see us having robust lives outside of work and then doing wonderful jobs at work as well um, while we're being compensated. So this is a passionate topic for me. So I did our genrefication during the regular school year. People always ask, well, did you shut down sections? Did you shut down checkout, whatever, to get it done? No, 
you just do it as you go. You know, like, yeah, when I quote unquote finished genrefying, a lot of the books had been checked out, so they didn't have their genre stickers on it. So we just had to catch them as they were returned throughout the year. It's not a big deal, you know. Uh, I think, uh, you know, as they were checked in, any book that didn't have a colored genre sticker on, we just put on a separate cart until I could get to it. No biggie, you know. Um, so it was all done, like you said, under construction. You know, students would come in and there would just be one shelf, totally wackadoo, out of alignment, not like not the way it's supposed to be that's okay if they needed a book from one of those shelves where i had things stacked and stickered and all whatever that was fine they could check it out just like normal i'll get it later so i do think genrefication stresses people out because of the the control like we want to do it a certain way at a certain pace and have it done perfectly but you know that whole thing where people say don't let perfection get in the way of you know good (laughs) or get in the way of done (laughs) so it is um it is possible to do it while circulation continues while regular operations continue and it just might take longer and that's okay you know well and i'm thinking that you know when you were talking about being able to genreify when the books were already checked out because a lot of this, the, what, what can be kind sort of time consuming is determining which sublocation you're going to put these books in. So in that case, those are things that you can actually do whether the books are, are physically in your collection or not. So that when they get checked back in, you'll see, Oh, that's supposed to go in, in our, our sports section. That's going in our adventure section. And you can then, you can then label them, uh, appropriately. So no, I, I, I totally understand. And I, have to remind myself that the person in the building whose expectations are the highest and hardest to manage when it comes to our space is ourselves. That there is nobody walking around thinking lesser of you because you happen to be in the middle of a process rather than completely done. Because I I know I've talked to some people who are like, look, I just want to get things done in the summer because when I open those doors at the beginning of the school year, I want us to be ready. And the reality is the only people in the building who can who can possibly know where we are in the process of something is us. Yes. And there's also kind of uh, like I also just discourage even if you're totally OK with giving up that time and not being compensated and whatever, I I sort of would caution librarians to not do too much labor in the invisible hours when nobody sees it being done. Because to be honest, we already struggle so much with people understanding the labor that we're doing. They don't understand it because they don't see it. And we don't need to help that issue along by doing things under the cover of night in the middle of the summer when everyone else is in Florida or wherever they're vacationing, right? And so, like, I mean, I don't really mind when students come in and see a messy library, me in the middle of a big project. It stimulates conversation. It lets them see what I'm doing. It lets me talk to them about why I'm doing it. I post I post videos and stuff on the Instagram to let our parents and fan community members know what I'm doing, too. It's like, this is not something I don't really want them to come back over the summer and have everything be perfect and done. And nobody have seen all the incredible labor of love that went into getting it there. Right. That that matters, too. On sadly for our funding and support, it matters that people understand the level of labor that goes into keeping a library running like that. So that is another consideration. If the money consideration doesn't bother you and the time doesn't bother you, think about the disservice to your program that you could be doing by letting people think these little magical elves come in over the summer and get all this work done, right? <laughs> Well, and I, I think the best piece of advice I ever got in library school was from one of my, uh, you know, one of the few library instructors who were, you know, like you by day in the trenches being in your, in the, in your school library. And that was, you know, I can't wait to come see you work in, in the libraries. We were all pre-service librarians. So, you know, we were going to be doing our, those, those, those service hours when we were working in our spaces. And they said, if I come into your library and every book is in place and and every shelf is perfect and there isn't a single mess to be seen, there's something terribly wrong about what you're doing. If the shelves aren't if there isn't evidence that kids are, are looking for books and that classes have been through to look at books and, and pull books off the shelves and there's no evidence that anybody is engaging with your collection, something is wrong. And there has to be evidence that kids are in there and regularly using it. So we sort of need to lower that bar. 
Right, because it's not really serving the purpose if it just looks pretty all the time but isn't being used. Like, I think people do get confused by this, too, because especially, like, people like me who post so many pictures where things look so perfect and pretty. It's like, what you have to understand, guys, is that when things are chaotic and messy, I don't have time to take pictures. And that's why there's no pictures of the library looking like that. You only see pictures of our library literally within five minutes of whenever I've done the thing that's being pictured. It hasn't gotten used yet, you know? When <laughs> friends, you've got to see some pictures because it'll just make you like it, it just inspires so many great ideas. You know, Kelsey, you've posted at least three times on the journey of genrefication, and I'm realizing that when I I took a great deal of your suggestions to heart and copied exactly what you wrote and some of the advice you gave in your posts when I genrefied my own collection for the first time. Deciding which genres we're going to use to organize our collection should be driven by our own specific collections. And yet I remember posting this on Library Facebook to sort of crowdsource what the best combination of those genre terms are. But I'm realizing we probably shouldn't stress too much because over the years those terms will change as well. Yeah, I mean, I've only been genrefied for, I don't even know, three or four years, and I've already changed things. I've changed what I've called sections, I've split sections, I've added things, I've deleted things. So it is sort of an, a moving target. <laughs> you know, you don't want to get too bogged down in the details of it because it does change. Like, some things just trend and then they don't trend or curricular units go away and new ones come in or, you know, whatever. So it is sort of always under construction, really. Absolutely. You know, I I think, but, you know, what did strike me when I was reading your blog post is how often you referred to this process as empowering our students, that when we genrefy, we're empowering our students, we're, we're supporting student access, and, and especially the confidence with which our students, you know, when they, when they do move through a genrefied collection, they have that, that it's inviting and they feel confident because they, they have an idea already of what kinds of books they're going to find when they go to certain parts of our collection. Yeah, especially if you're doing, if you're choosing sections that really match up with demonstrated student need and interest and curricular units, and you're using really clear signage, (laughs) it's really important. It is very important to have very clear signage. Otherwise, the genres are not distinguishable to people. Um, But when you do that, it really does empower students. It's the number one reason to do it. I mean, people talk about increasing circulation, and and that is a byproduct of it, but not really the sole purpose. The purpose is is to empower students to be able to walk into the library and navigate it independently and successfully. I know I'm not the only librarian who has watched in despair as children have come and stared at this row of books and had no idea where to even start into picking something they might like because it's in alphabetical order by author last name. That doesn't help anybody if they don't know the authors they like already, right? It truly is like a terrible way to organize nice books from the user's point of view when we really think about it. My best analogy is, can you imagine what it would be like to cook dinner if the grocery store organized food in alphabetical order instead of grouped by type? Do you know? And do you think about that? If you needed apples, some of them would be under L for lady, whatever. I don't even know different kinds of apples, but you know what I'm talking about. They wouldn't even all necessarily be under A for apple. They'd be under the letters of the types of apples. Like, can you imagine how tough that would be? How often do you think you'd want a grocery shop, let alone cook, if that was the battle you had to go through to get the ingredients? It's the same for our students. How, how, how enjoyable is browsing and finding books when it's that difficult and, and indecipherable to them? That's why I watch students continue to check out P- Percy Jackson over and over and over again because they just simply didn't know what else to pick. Now, all the books next to the Percy Jackson books are also fantasy action adventures. It is easy for them now to find other books that they would also like. So that is my biggest advocacy for it's not just about increasing circulation although that will happen. I don't think a single librarian has genrefied and not increased circulation Um, but it is about flipping the library to be more student centered, user centered. It is not about making it easier for the librarian rather it is about making it easier for the reader. 
Well, and I I love that you mentioned, compared the library to the grocery store, because even when I taught my littles, you know, we talked about the grocery store and, and how is it that you can go into any grocery store and know where to find things? And, and even my littles, they're like, well, Miss Herman, you just look at the sign and you just have to read the sign. And I was like, oh, see? And then we were talking, in this case, we we're talking about, about signage and making sure that, that signage for our, 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 our early readers and our pre-readers, you know, have pictures and, and it empowers them to be able to find things. But again, you, the, the grocery stores, the supermarkets are, are so user friendly. They're so built with the customer in mind. We need to take a cue from that. Um, you know, to make sure that when our, our customers are coming into shop, that they feel confident about moving around our aisles. And it, it makes sense. And I, I never thought about that, but you know, I love that you mentioned that because you're absolutely right. And friends, Kelsey mentioned signage. You are not going to believe the signs that she is included in her freebies because you have skills when it comes to graphic design. Do you have any artistic background or is this something you're just sort of, it just, you've had a lot of fun working digitally uh, and, and generating signs that then you then share with, with everybody? I have always enjoyed design. Um, I've never done it uh, any kind of like official degrees in it. I did my bachelor is in art history, so I've always been interested in art, you know. Um, but I'm not very good at any fine arts. But I am. I have found that I am good and enjoy design. So um, I like to play around on Canva and design really colorful but helpful signage. So I do like to combine images with color, with um, key terms. I, somebody said this to me the other day. I can't remember who it was, but they said they appreciated my signage that it had multiple keywords for for each genre. And I said that's because it's not every student knows what fantasy means. So on my signs, it will say fantasy, and then it will have a dragon or something on it. And then it will have different magic, adventure, kingdoms, princesses, you know, it has the different keywords to help so that whether they know the word fantasy or not, with the context of all of that together, most people can figure out what kind of story is on this bookcase underneath this sign. So I appreciate the compliment. I do, I do very much enjoy designing signage. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I'm only recently come to appreciate how vitally important it is when we genrefy our collections that that is also reflected in our catalog. Mm. And so this isn't just about labeling your books, which we will talk about, but it's also about changing the the record in our, our digital, you know, when we look at our, our actual catalog and, our, and you know, can you use... I'll say after 14 years of looking at a standard online collection and then now looking at one that's genrefied, for me, I, I took your advice. I created a sublocation of where the fiction would be broken down. And, and it really does, it has to change because you're, you're, you're changing the book and where it's located in the library. That has to be reflected in the uh, online catalog as well. Yeah. And I think this is one of the things that stumps people with genre frying where like sometimes the people that are opposed to it, it is out of a concern that it somehow means ca like the library is chaos and that like a student who does want Percy Jackson would not know where to look for that book. But that is not the case as long as you do change things in the catalog. So in the, you know, when a library is organized by standard Dewey, we teach students to search Percy Jackson in the catalog and then to get the call number and then to take that call number and look around at the signage to find that book on the shelf, right? Nothing is different when it's genrefied as long as you add the genre information to the catalog. People do that usually in two ways. You either change the call number itself to include the genre. Some people do that. So instead of F-R-I-O for Reardon, it would be um, fantasy F-R-I-O. So some people do it that way. The other way is the way I do it, which is to leave the call numbers as they are and to simply add a sublocation. So I also do a copy cat catalog as well, category, which we could talk about later why I do both. But so for my students, the only thing that changes for them is that now in the catalog, when they search in Percy Jackson, they just have to look at the two pieces of information, which are right next to each other. 
F R I O, and then underneath it it says the sublocation, which is fantasy. So that's it. And that's the only difference I had to teach them was just, hey, make sure you take both of these pieces of information. For the first one tells you which section to go in. You can look up to find the signs to find the section. Very easy. And then within that section, it's still alphabetical, just like always. So it, it isn't really a new skill or, or a different skill. It's really the same skill. And that's why I always try to tell people, like, some of your concerns about genrefication are based on misunderstandings of the process. We still teach all the same skills. Genrefication doesn't change anything for the people who know which book they want. It only changes things for all the students, which are most of the students, that don't know which book they want. You know, in this case, what I, I love is that, you know, your blog posts and friends do make time um, to take a look at these blog posts because it does spell out with with incredible specificity, you know, sort of the considerations that were put into to how you do things. Labeling. There are so many options with pros and cons. And my solution was to make use of the supplies I happen to have on hand. And I'm glad I did that. And, and I talked to you a little bit about it at the time. You know, what advice would you give to those who have a budget and they want to, they want very much to move forward with this undertaking. I would um, advise not to spend a lot of budget on labels if you don't have to, just because it really isn't used by the students. The label just tells the shelver which where to put a book. It really isn't in for, like it's not something the student needs. So I personally would never redirect significant amount of my budget towards really fancy genre labels if I was genrefying because all the fantasy books are going to be together. So at that point the label doesn't really tell anybody anything important. Um so I would do it like you said, what you have on hand, what's affordable, what's easily attainable, obtainable. That's what I would do. I would save the money to be used for something of more higher priority for the library. Um, but I like to go the simple color route. Some people like to buy the ones that have the word on it or the image on it, a, a dragon or the word fantasy or whatever. I think it's really pure preference. There's really no, I don't think any right or wrong way to go there. But however you think the library should look, I guess. Well, and can I just tell you, friends, I don't know if Kelsey remembers this, but uh, she this meant the world to me. Last fall, I reached out to her because all I had were these little color dots. And and I I really, those happened to be on hand. I think I had to buy a few more extra colors. And then Kelsey said something really funny. She said, you know, if you cut those in half, you'll have twice as many. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, you see those dots? Cut them in half, and they're they're three quarters of an inch. And I swear, it is. I laugh about it every time I look at them because they're now all done, and they all look they're like little half moons. And then here's the best part: Kelsey did something even one better. When she buys the book, she writes the year in the dot so that when she's looking at them, she has like the acquisition year. Like it'll just say, you know, 17 for 2017, 18 for 2018. That solves a lot of questions just looking at it. It's like you can still see the color. And now I know the year it was purchased. That's amazing. I mean, you might as well because you're there, you're labeling, right? I, I, I love that. You know, your blog posts emphasize the importance of reassessing earlier decisions. And I think we're all concerned about having to undo earlier efforts and thereby wasting our time. But this isn't a one and done project. After one year, I already know that there are adjustments that I'm going to need to support my student access. Yeah, it's it's really, this is really one of the biggest barriers to genrefying is this need that people have and librarians have to get it perfect um, so they can get it done. And it really is something I've had to work very hard to rid myself of, too, because I'm no better than anybody else when it comes to this want, need for things to be done and to be right, you know. Um, but it, it does. You sort of have to free yourself of that and, and kind of just be ready for the inevitable changes you're going to have to make. It helps you start to not worry about getting it perfect. Like, I, people always say, what if a book has more than one genre? This is like the number one question from people who want to genrefy but just can't imagine doing it. It's like this fear of picking the wrong genre. It's like, well, it doesn't matter which genre you choose because if the kid wants that specific book, they're still going to be able to find it in the catalog anyway. And so just pick one. It literally, it does not matter which genre you choose. Put it in one and see if it circulates. If after a year it hasn't circulated, 
I take it and I put it in the other genre. I just put the different sticker on it, put the different sublocation on it, and I try it somewhere else. So it's no stress, you know, you can change things. Am I remembering correctly, you wrote this in your blog, that if you have two copies, try putting one in each. And so if you're if you're wrestling over over dueling, you know, genres, instead of putting them both together, if you have two copies of a book, um, put one in one section, one in the other, and see which one circulates more. I don't know. I mean... I do sometimes do that, yeah. <laughs> I really struggled with Firekeeper's Daughter. Like, it really, it was like, is it a mystery, or is it like a cultural, you know, identity book, and it's both? So I think I, I had like four copies, so I put two in each genre to see where it would circulate. And, and then I just reassess later, or, you know, it doesn't really... I just try not to stress too much about that that perfection thing, <laughs> but it's hard. <laughs> yeah, don't let perfection be the enemy of the good. Um, you know, as a, a Tracy Chun said, "You're brave before perfect." So, you know, um, one such realization comes after after the initial process of genrefication has happened is that a genre like realistic fiction is too big, and even in one year in, I can tell you right now. I'm going to have to to do this reassessment where where our realistic fiction gets subdivided again and it's fascinating because you've come up with some fantastic solutions. One of them you created a section called adversity. Could you sort of speak to that and, and how the decision to to pull books from your realistic fiction and create a a, a collection called adversity? Yeah, this was one of those things that uh, realistic fiction was one I really struggle with because if I just had it as realistic, it was just too big, which then doesn't make it helpful because the point of genrefying is to chunk things into smaller topics. So a huge mass of realistic was sort of defeating the purpose. So I went, this was one of those ones that was informed by our curricular units, um, which helped give me the inspiration for how to mix mix this genre up. And it was because in our ELA classes, we were having um, some units that specifically were wanting, it was like, you can pick any book you want, but it has to have this theme of overcoming an obstacle or of adversity. And then another grade level was doing these units where it was um, any book you wanted, but it had to have a theme of like identity or culture, like uh, that being a significant influence on somebody like coming of age. So that was kind of where I got my idea for the main split between realistic. And it did help because it kind of was more tonal. Like there's sort of, we have realistic that's a little bit more lighthearted or a little bit more just about regular life. And that's sort of what I have as like identity culture culture, relationships. And then we have these ha kind of heavier tone where it's like dealing with more really specific tough stuff, which can range from grief of a loved one to addiction in the family or in yourself to, you know, police violence to like all of these heavier things. So that's how I ended up splitting them. And then later I, I even I split out humor to its own section, uh, sports to its own section. And I've really been wrestling with whether to do romance or not. I, I really am struggling with that because... It's hard because romance isn't like YA romance isn't always m only about romance. It's usually mixed up with identity stuff um, or culture or family. So I've been struggling with how, how or if to split that. But we'll see. <laughs> well, and I got to tell you, I, I have the relationships identity section and it is heavily trafficked. It yeah. is by far, uh, and I'm very upfront and I explain to my students, this is where you're going to find your, your romance. And this is where you're going to find your LGBTQIA. And honest to goodness, that is the most trafficked area of our collection right now with our independent readers. And, and that's, that's heartwarming. And it, it, it's a very easy indicator as to, you know, where I should continue to consider investing in that collection because the, po the popularity of those books is so is so evident you know you you spelled out these revisions in in your three years later post um this episode is in no way meant friends to replace an absolute careful study of Kelsey's blog posts. And I, of course, I've, I've put links in the show notes. And I'm fascinated to see how genrefication evolved over time. I'm going to quote you. You wrote, quote, I look forward to continuing to tweak, in this case, your genrefication, to ensure it keeps meeting the always shifting needs of our students, end quote. That's just the number one driving thing that, you know, keeps me 
figuring out collection development, I think we get, it's so easy to get overwhelmed by all the lot duties for a librarian. Like, especially because we're rarely told which duties to sp- focus on <laughs> you know you just put down in the library by yourself and they're like good luck <laughs> you know figure it out and so it is there is a million things we could be doing all the time and how do you choose and not work for free over the summers <laughs> um at least not in a reasonable degree um and so I always go back to that question of what what is meeting the current and emerging needs of today of my students right now. That really does help me narrow down my focus on things. Like even when I'm purchasing and when I'm weeding and when I'm genrefying, that always that's what I you know that's where I go back to, and it does help keep me from getting too overwhelmed. Of course, they have plenty of needs, so there's still plenty to dig into there. But it does help because it you can sometimes get sort of wrapped into trying to do the things you're seeing trending on social media or the thing you saw another librarian do or this or that or this thing you read about in this article the other day. It's, it's so overwhelming. So if you just always kind of go back to that, keeping your, your eyes on that specific, meeting my current and emerging needs of my students today, that helps, I think. It helps me, anyway, lower my anxiety about what I should focus on. <laughs> You know, this was something that was completely unexpected when I was reading your blog posts, and math is not my strong suit, but you went so far as to plan the footprint of your shifting collection. Would you please explain what you did to anticipate how genrefication would rearrange your current existing shelving configuration? (laughs) So... This is so, I am so extra sometimes. I I doubt most people go as far as I did with this, but um, there's this TikTok sound that says, I have never been relaxed ever. And that is clearly me because you can see that in the math I did for this. But I was concerned, probably rightfully so from seeing other people run into this issue. I was concerned when, when all my books were stickered and it was time to move them into their sections, I was concerned at how to figure out how many shelves to allow for each section because I didn't want to just start laying the books out and then reach the end and have five extra bookcases empty for the last genre and then, you know, not have room to grow the other genres. So I really wanted to make sure that I was going to allocate enough shelf space plus some for growth. Um, And so I did. I... (laughs) It was an, it was a bit much, but I did take all the books, um, and on every bookcase, I sorted them by genre, just within the bookcase, and then I did take a tape measure, and I did go, and I measured the linear <laughs> inches of every single genre on every single shelf, and then I added it up and divided it by how many inches I thought was appropriate per shelf, which is about 60% of the shelf if you're doing spines out, um, and then that's how I allocated the footprint. And to be honest, it did work pretty well. I don't regret doing it because now three or four years later, I haven't had to do any really significant reshifts of genre space. So I I don't regret it, but I'm not a math person either. So that was a real stretch for me. (laughs) Can I just have you say that again for the people in the back? What percentage of your bookshelf should be occupied by 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 spines out (laughs) well it's not 100 percent, so that's definitely not right i don't know if there's a standard expectation for this i i've heard people say 50 percent or 75 percent no more than 75 percent certainly um when i used to do spines out i would shoot for no more than 60 percent because that used to allow for about two front facing books on the end of each shelf and so that was kind of how my guide which then allows for adding and and then if you still have to weed back down once you get further than that. But yeah, I shoot for about 60%. Um, definitely not more than 75. I um I love my library assistant, and he is a former <laughs> math teacher. I love him to death. But left to his own devices, I, I the first and I intercepted him very quickly, but was filling the entire shelf with books. <laughs> And I, I sort of said, I'm going to have to stop you right there. <laughs> we're we're going to fill up the bookshelves. So I'm using my hands and I'm showing him just this much because yeah, we, and it was, it, but it's funny because if you've never been taught 
it's something that just doesn't really come up. But yes, ideally between 60 and 75% of the shelf is occupied and the rest is space for things to move or be displayed. Oh my goodness. It was just... <laughs> yes, because you, you realize how hard it is to shelve a cart full of books if every bookshelf is already 100% full. Then it then it, shelving becomes a nightmare. So it eventually will bite you. You'll eventually figure out why that's not working, but best to just nip it in the bud I, early. I, I was very... Uh, during the pandemic, I was, I was moved to a couple couple libraries I hadn't worked in before. And I walked in and, and almost had a heart attack because when you pulled a book off the shelf, three more came with it because they were so tightly packed. And that wasn't because there were too many books on the shelves. That's because nobody had weeded ever. Like right. it was just, it was just, the, we just keep on putting more books on the shelf and you pulled one off and three fell on the floor. It's like, oh my gosh, we've got our work cut out for ourselves. I have to ask you, you genrefied your memoirs. This is amazing. Yes. Friends, I have, my 11th graders are doing a memoir unit and I'm so excited. First of all, you pulled your, your memoirs away from your biographies and now you've, can you just speak a little bit about the process of genrefying your memoirs? Is this because your, your students also do a unit or you just thought it'd be fun? <laughs> well, genrefying does become sort of addicting. <laughs> once you start to split things, it starts to kind of escalate. Um, and so once, you know, fiction was working so well, now I'm looking at my nonfiction, I'm looking at my graphic novels, I'm looking at my memoirs. Um, but for us, um, yeah, we had I had pulled memoirs out of the standard nonfiction area um, previously because we do have eleventh grade does a unit uh, about which is prepping them for writing their applications for college. I think it's uh, like the personal narrative or whatever, and so they they have like free reading memoir a whole unit of it where they can read any memoir they want, but they have to be reading a memoir. Um, and so we biographies don't get a lot of action in our library, so I just keep biographies in their regular nonfiction spot. But the memoirs, their own section, it made sense because we constantly have classes and kids coming in like, where are the memoirs? Um, and then I, I was just seeing the same problem happening with, that I saw with the fiction. Kids would come in and stare at the shelves of memoirs and just really not have any inkling of where to start because – what kind of memoir are you interested in, right? And I was having to do, well, I was getting to do so much reader's advisory and assisting readers with finding books. Um, but, you know, eventually that becomes inefficient when there's only one librarian. And so it made sense at that point for me to consider, um, I don't know if you can call it genrefying when it's nonfiction, topicifying maybe, whatever, but you know what I mean. <laughs> but yeah, basically I did genrefy and I did it, um, that one took some thinking because there wasn't as many other people that had done that for me to kind of steal ideas from. Um, but I did break it up into some of the sort of overarching types of memoir kids tended to ask for. Friends, because I have her, her actual uh, blog post up that I'm looking right now, we've got athletes, military, adventure. We have notable people, humor. We also have a Holocaust memoir. And, um, you know, again, this, when you look at it this way, it makes so much more sense because it localizes, you know, I've, I'm so lucky this, this past week, my public library brought us 115 memoirs. I so saw you post that. That's awesome. I was so excited. And my kids are all getting digital library cards and they're all checking them out for their 11th grade memoir unit. I just physically don't have enough. And, and the average age of my collection of, of memoirs is 2004. So I, I really do need some help. And they were fantastic because they brought in influencers. They brought a lot of athletes. We've got um, actors. We have uh, all sorts of people who are, are, and you know, what you call them notable people. You know, they're just, and, and so it's wonderful because it does give my students a sense of, of, of why these people are, are important and why we should be reading about them. It connects with your curriculum and it, it and your teachers are going to love you for it. So this is time well spent. <laughs> I also like having memoirs as their own section because it, memoirs to me are like a really good um, entry point for students that don't love to read. Um, I know people call them reluctant readers or there's all these different words. I usually just say kids who say they don't like to read because that's truly what they say. Um, but a lot of times memoirs are good sells for those students because it really is just like somebody telling a story about their life. It, there's not a lot of world building. There's not a lot of complex um 
point of views or different shifting narrative type strategies and techniques, you know, so it is sort of a good, like graphic novels, in my opinion, memoirs are another great entry point section for students who are maybe not so into reading or not yet so into reading. And so I like having them in their own section for that too. But again, when it's just one anonymous grouping, it's just, it's a little bit inaccessible. So the grouping it up has helped, I think. Absolutely. You've written extensively and you've presented extensively on the topic of genrefication. Listeners would love to know what pitfalls should we, should we try to avoid? I know you've gone through some of the big ones, but you know, this is sort of one last, one last chance to really sort of get, get your messaging out about genrefication. What would you advise listeners not to do? <laughs> um, I would definitely advise uh, you not to overthink it. Um, that is, I think, the biggest thing that prevents people from doing it, even when they are interested and want to do it. It's just you feel like it's so complicated, but it's really not. You're just choosing sensible groupings to chunk a library up to make it more accessible. So there are more entry points for more students. That's all you're doing. It, it's not. There's no way to do it right or wrong. You're not doing anything that libraries have haven't already been doing for decades and centuries, right? People get into their head about I'm not following the rules of Dewey or whatever. But the fact is that we haven't been for a long time now. Fiction is technically supposed to be in the 800s of the Dewey Decimal System. The whole concept of a fiction section is already breaking all the rules anyway. And guess what? The reason we did that all those decades ago or centuries ago was for the same reason we say to John Refine now, it was because it didn't make sense and it was confusing to people. So we pulled it out and that we've been doing that ever since, right? We've we've been pulling graphic novels out for a long time now. Biographies have been pulled out for a long time now. You know, sometimes paperbacks, for some reason, are pulled out from the hardcovers. That is one I don't really understand because to me that is like not helpful at all to a user uh, because how are you supposed to know whether the book you want is a paperback or whatever? But either way, we've been doing this. We've been chunking collections for forever in our in our profession this is not a new concept so I like that I think that overwhelms people and so just try not to think of it as a big new complicated thing you're trying and think of it just as making adjustments to the collection to make it more accessible you can do it small scale you don't have to genre for the whole collection you know maybe start with the most commonly requested genre first pull that out see how it goes maybe then the next year you try another one you know this doesn't always have to be all or nothing I think I think that's the biggest stumbling block for people is just looking at the scale of it as like this whole big thing but you know it doesn't have to be all or nothing you could do it in small steps and small chunks Kelsey Bogan you are an absolute delight and I I love listening to you you're is you're irreverent and and you've got levity and you are you are I'm sure you are greatly appreciated and admired by your students uh, both both your 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 library science students as well as your students every day Kelsey I'm hoping you'll uh, remind us and, and friends will make sure to put this in the show notes how can we find you on social media Oh, well, I'm pretty much always on Twitter, just at Kelsey Bogan. <laughs> um, but I, my blog, you know, don't you shush me.com. And then where else am I? Instagram and TikTok, my school accounts are GVHS library. But more often, if you need to talk to me personally, Twitter is the place to find me. Outstanding. I hope you have a fantastic school year. Thank you so much, Kelsey Bogan. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. Kelsey Bogan is an absolute joy. You'll love reading her blog posts, following her on Twitter, and all of her entertaining TikToks. If you found this episode helpful, please share it out with your team, your PLN, and on social media. Be sure to follow on your favorite podcatcher so you'll never miss an episode. And if you really like listening today, consider sending a little fan mail Kelsey Bogan's way, and you'll be glad you did because having Kelsey in your virtual PLN is going to make a big difference in your every day because she has so much to share. One last friendly reminder, I encourage you friends to take advantage of Capstone's generous $20 discount off an order of $100 or more using the code UNITED. The topic of our next episode will be Champion Defender and my conversation with Martha Hickson. I hope you will tune in.